What inspired you, Dee, to show this gritty reality um, version of this world as opposed to what you call the red carpet narrative? Mm. Well, honestly, there were so many reasons why I, I wanted to do this film, but uh, I think tonight I'm going to choose to go with, <laughs> you know, just being inspired by the condition of my community, Black people, and how we communicate and lack of communication and the animosity and the the, tra the trauma and, uh, you know, the unhealed nature that we have as Black people, it really leads to a lot of the stories in Kokomo City. I mean, it sounds really far-fetched, but look, we have DL guides because they're not comfortable with, with admitting and accepting who they are because as children, we're taught that this is wrong. We're shamed that this is wrong. We're churched that this is wrong. We're beaten and punished like I was that this is wrong, right? And so when you have these men that are absolutely attracted to trans women or gay men, you know, they're hiding. Rather, it's because they have children or, you know, a wife at home or girlfriend. Um, and, and and trans women, is kind of like they have traumas too because they don't trust the men. And and, and the whole thing is just a cycle. So there's there's a lot of reasons why I was inspired to do Kokomo City. But, uh, but it was definitely because of, you know, uh, this is something as a trans woman that I wanted to bring to the table to start a conversation uh, that obviously is very needed to have. Before I get to how you and Harris hooked up with Lena Wade and hooked up with each other to bring this to the screen, I want to talk to how you were able to get people to be so transparent, mm -hmm. openly transparent mm -hmm. about very personal, deep, sensitive subjects, including Miss Daniela mm -hmm. here. So. Were you and Daniela friends ahead of time? Like, how did how did you get Daniela and Lo? Mm -hmm. You know, who <laughs> Lo? I was like, oh, Lo went all the way there. Yeah. So, you know, how did you get these people to trust you and open up to you? Well, I think overall, I was in a extremely vulnerable, uh, unstable place in my life. Like after producing for fifteen years and coming out as transgender, doing music, um, you know, I experienced a lot of homelessness and really hard to kind of stabilize myself and and maintain a any kind of decent lifestyle for myself um you know and a few years after that i decided to do kokomo city because i figured with everything that i've i've earned and opportunities that i've had in the industry as a producer it wasn't enough after i transitioned people just completely disregarded me and looked at me you know Transgender, that's it. She, he, it belongs over there and not with us. And uh, I felt disregarded. And I thought, well, damn, how, how do trans women that have to survive with sex work, how do they survive mentally? How do they get through, you know? And I was just drawn naturally to find anything close to what I was going through. And, and, and uh, you know, when I approached the girls, I was very, uh, humbled by their experiences and learning more about what they have to go through. And uh, I I think also me explaining wh what my intentions were as a filmmaker to do Kokomo City was something new. It wasn't, you know, I'm going to sit you on a, on a, you know, tool, I'm at a stool in <laughs> front of a brick wall and, you know, we're going to do the documentary thing. I was like, no, we want to do something fun, provocative. I want this. I want that. No glam, no makeup. They were like, wait, what? <laughs> but with all of that, I think there was a, there was a insatiable desire to do something different and, uh, and kind of liberate themselves as trans women and speak through a different, you know, microphone. I get that, you know, being a black woman in the film critic space, yeah. I can relate to being different and mm -hmm. being ostracized mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So I totally have empathy and understanding in that regard. Mm -hmm. Daniela, mm -hmm. talk to me about how um, Dee came to you with this, this film and what was it that she said that made you go, okay, girl, I got you. So Dee didn't come to me. <laughs> Listen. My girlfriend came to me. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, so my girlfriend um, mentioned that Dee, so she knew Dee Smith, actually, Angelica mm -hmm. Torres. Um, and so she was saying, oh, I think this is a really good project that you want to be a part of. I met up with Dee at the opening of The Gospel in New York. And then we turned it out that night. And then she was like, oh, I have this really, you know, interesting project. I would love to include you if you're interested. And I said yes, because I think for me, 
the best way to put it is that at that point in my life, I had thrived, but I was surviving. Mm -hmm. And so after doing, you know, the TED Talks, after, as Dee would say, you know, the red carpet moments, you know, being with Laverne and all these people, the best way to put it is I would leave the gala in these thousand dollar gallons, but had no, no way to get home. And so for me, it was like, I wanted to stop living this facade of being this thriver and successful on social media. But I also wanted women to know that like, no matter what we have gone through, no matter even if we've gotten opportunities, but we're struggling, it's okay to stand in that. And when I was able to stand in my truth, then I was able to speak truth to power. And and for me, that's all I wanted. Like, I just wanted to live in my truth and I wanted D to allow me to you know, live in that truth in a way that didn't feel very scripted, you know, because I, in, when you're in activism and stuff like that, you have talking points. Right. And for me, so many people who don't know me on a personal level don't know that like, I'm a person, like I'm very funny. I'm like very, you know, outgoing, ratchet too. <laughs> and so, and, and when I'm not in front of the white person, I can be a black person. And so when I was with a black person who allowed me to just be, it was an opportunity to really be myself without having to be polished. And so that's a cool Well, let me just say, you're a very powerful speaker. We saw how powerful of a speaker you are in the film and through the things that you said. And I was very highly touched and impressed with what you said in the film. So let me just acknowledge that and say that to you while I have you here. Thank you. Okay, so Harris, you are up. So talk to me about how you and Dee collaborated on Kokomo City. And uh, yeah, just tell us about that. So Dee had been working in Kokomo City for three years, right? Three years. Um, and Dee, um, all on her own, wrote it, well, didn't write, directed it, edited it, produced it, filmed it, like literally did everything. Applause for that. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, and so then um, through um, a, I think it was maybe like five, it was your friend Dustin's mm -hmm. friend Gave it to his friend, yeah. who gave it to Nick, who gave it to me. Yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah, literally. Like my my best yeah. friend Dustin works at a bar. He's a bartender. Yeah. So it's and a bar and everyone that came in there, he told yeah. about the film. And yeah. he stumbled across someone that, yeah. that could actually help. Yeah. And, well, and, knew right. somebody five that people. Yeah, right, exactly. You know? yeah. Exactly. And so then, so so Nick was like, I think you would like this. And so um, I, I turned it on and I was like, I do like this. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, I, I saw what was like this incredible talent and these like incredible voices. And I thought like, you know, this could like come through in like, you know, such a, a big way. And so I, Oh, one second. Yeah. This is Stacy from the film, y'all. Yeah, she wrote Ain't I Woman, the song at the end. Oh, yeah. we, we gonna yeah. talk about that. Yeah. 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 Okay, so finish, my dear. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, um, and so, um, you know, I thought I could help. Yeah, you know, I felt like Dee's voice was so clear and so loud, and I just felt like I could hear her voice, and I felt like like I might be able to to help it like be even louder and come through even more. And so, you know, we um, connected, and you know, and I, I watched that process. How he helped me make it louder and clearer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he decided to send me after he watched the film an amazing email with a lot of notes. <laughs> but you know what? It was my aha come to Jesus moment because I put myself into it as a creator, but, but the technical, um, the really important things that really, really makes a film successful or create a trajectory for a film to go to a Sundance it was him bringing those notes. Right. It wouldn't have happened without it. I don't care who. Come on, it, it, it just Come wouldn't on. have happened. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't have happened. I love it. There's no way. I love it. it would, he it. used his connections at Sundance to, because he believed in his film and, and used his personal connection and connected me with someone at Sundance as, as the producer that he is. That's what happened. Yes, I had this 
finished thing. I mean, it's almost like a music producer. You could create the beautiful, the most beautiful song. It could be for Beyonce or Celine Dion or, you know, Jesus. But if no one <laughs> has the <laughs> capability to get to Jesus, it's, it's going to go to hell. It's not going to go into hell. <laughs> so Harris really connected those dots and, and mentored me a lot through this process. Sure. Not the connection to Jesus. I'm feeling that. I'm so feeling that. I want to talk to you about the aesthetic of the film because the way it's shot is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. The whole, it gave me like a um it had like a, a film noir French mm -hmm. artistic mm -hmm. vibe to it. And I just want to know what inspired you to shoot it that way, where we have no color, mm -hmm. it's just black and white. Mm -hmm. And I love that because it makes the audience pay attention to what's being said mm -hmm. as opposed to focusing on the set mm -hmm. or this color over there, or that mm -hmm. hair color over yeah. here. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you just answered. So you have another question? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. <laughs> no, 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 you killed it. No, that was it. That was it. But I mean, basically what it was is I wanted to elevate the transgender narrative. Like, I don't know, like, there are so many fortresses and rules around people uh, of the transgender experience. And we always preach as trans people or queer people how we want to just be humanized, right? But we have these things that don't allow people and actually encourage people not to talk to us, not to approach us. And, and I wanted to not only encourage that uh those rules and those fortresses to kind of like, you know, be dismantled. But I also wanted visually to uh, elevate these women and their stories. And I thought what was what was beautiful to me is like when I before I did the film, I started shooting um, photographs with my phone in the city and I would put them in black and white. So I'm in New York City taking pictures of like the most grittiest, shittiest, images but then i would convert them to black and white and it all of a sudden just became really elevated in stories and it, it almost looked like you could you could see where this came from or this shoe or this you know condom on the ground or this dead bird or whatever it is it just became this beautiful classic story and you just want to know what is the story behind these images so to have that grit of, of these girls and the troops and that tension that they created you know, with black and white, I just thought it was, it would be really fun and, and adventurous to, to do. It's beautiful. Thank mm -hmm. you. It really yeah. is. It's quite lovely. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about something that I heard in the film that struck me some kind of way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, mm -hmm. in the Sanctified Church, mm -hmm. Kojic. Church of God Me Christ. too. Me too. So you know. Just tell me the name. <laughs> What's the name of the Christ church? Christ Community Temple. Oh my God, went to Croom Temple. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> wow. So I know that growing up black in that kind of church, mm -hmm. there is a lot of judgment that happens mm -hmm. in that church community. Mm -hmm. And I also know that black mothers who are in that church have a certain ideology and a fixation when it comes to certain things. Mm -hmm. And in the film, when I forget who is who said it, so please forgive me. But when someone spoke about, was it you, Danielle? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. When you, when, you, when you spoke about when you spoke about the the, the fear of a black mother mm -hmm. having a black male mm -hmm. child and being abandoned by that child because this mother wanted that male figure to protect her. And now she has this male figure in her life that is going to protect her in a different way, but she doesn't see it that way. Incredible. She sees it as being abandoned. Yeah. She sees it as somebody that wants to be what she is, and she doesn't, and we as Black people don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to understand that sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if all three of you wouldn't mind speaking to that. And I'll start with, with Daniela first. So what's interesting actually is that I just last weekend, so for me spiritually, whenever I'm like, you know, all over the place, I have to go back to my childhood church. And it was so funny is because I was there and they, in that message, right? So the first time I went back to the church, nobody knew who I was. 
So it was like, a work sister. But the second time, I work sister. Welcome, sister. <laughs> 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 Right. And when you do that tithe and offering, you know what I mean? I but, know. And, and, but this time I was sitting in a church and just this past Sunday, and they had to make it very clear that I was in a church. And they said, you know, men are men want to be women and women want to be men, and, and that's against God. And so I thought about, though, for me and my upbringing and being raised in a church, right, I had to literally accept, right, that my mother wanted me to protect her that I am now almost 30 and she think I'm still gonna become a boy again. Mm -hmm. And I had to realize and loving myself means I have to let that go. Mm -hmm. And I even shared this mm -hmm. yesterday for the first time was that when we were in Berlin and we were headed to the premiere, my mother literally told me that she accepted that I was dead to her. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a moment where I'm thriving, in a moment where I feel you know accepted and loved, and, and even through spirituality, right? Honor that mother or that father or that day shall be shorter. I had to live in life without a mother. And, and the only mother figure I have is a trans woman who don't even have a mother. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning in my own experience as a black trans woman that learning what motherhood is, learning what being a mother looks like for me or a sister is to love myself mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Because my mother expected me to be the man that I would have never been. And, and I always say this, the male version of me couldn't have protected me in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the woman in me protected me from this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And and when I knew how much that meant to me, I always say I would not give away joy for somebody else's satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. And that's literally where I leave it, you know, like my my joy is not for you to police. Wow. I also want to talk about, and, and maybe maybe Harris can answer this one. So I I know that there's this uh, there's this thing where I feel like hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of times in the trans community that many trans people in the community are ostracized because a people don't understand what being trans is. They just look at it as being different and something that they don't understand. And so because they don't understand it, they have a tendency to lash out because at some point in their life, they were hurt and they don't know how to process that. So hurt people hurt people. And I just wanna know your thoughts on that, Harris. In terms of transness, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I've I know you're not trans, but you I mean, can yeah, speak to it. You know I, I, I mean? can, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think like, uh, <laughs> no, no, we're not gonna let Danielle. No, 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 <laughs> oh, now you just gonna be quiet now. No, 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 no. I know. I, I think that you know. Okay, so I think that that like what's going on in our society, like in general, with like you know, like the LGBT community in terms of like like everyone coming and attacking and trying like politically to suppress people. I think is like this idea of. I, I don't know, trying to hold on to, to something that, that never existed and mm -hmm. people are like, everyone's fighting for their own sort of like peace in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, you know, in terms of transness, I mean like, you know, it's just like, who fucking cares? Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, like, who fucking cares? Like, who doesn't, who cares if you're gay? Who cares if you're trans? Like, like I think what's beautiful of this film is that like by the end of it, like it's not about like anyone being trans or being black or being anything, but actually being human. I think that's what's really like powerful and what really works in this film is this concept at the end that you're like, like I know this crazy girl, <laughs> and, and, and I want to hang out with her, right? And it's sort of like that's like that feeling at the end. I think is like one of the most powerful political statements that you can make because you're not making a political statement; you're just being. And so I feel like that's where like this is important. I feel like that's what like our world needs is like, can you just take a minute to just get to know people? Yeah. Cause like otherwise people are just people, like everyone's yeah. fucked up, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. everyone's got their shit yeah. and everyone's working through it and people are lashing out based on their own self-hatred. Yeah. Mm. You know? yeah. See, I knew you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you could do it. Don't let Danielle's love 
intimidate you. No, I'm not even going to say this. So, and I think the interesting to just yeah. add a little bit to this yeah. is that I think most people don't realize this. What is trans when you don't even know that you actually encounter trans people? Mm. And and so the thing is because not every trans person is visibly trans. Exactly. And and I think about that oftentimes, right? Like so when we say what is trans, you don't know what trans is until that person tells you they're trans. And unless you can see that they're trans. So even in that, right? Like we mm-hmm. don't know what trans is until we're either, you know, we see it or we know it. That's right. And that's a part of the problem in society. People need to know that you're trans mm-hmm. in order to accept you. Mm-hmm. They should just, it's like Harris said, you should just, just accept people for being a human being. Right. Like you being uh-huh. trans is part of you being a human being. Right. It's not, it doesn't define who you are. That's right. You know what right. I mean? That's yeah. right. So just to round out the conversation, I'm going to bring you on up here, Stacey. Get off that phone. (laughs) 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 Yeah, come on, mama. (laughs) All right, so we're going to talk about Ain't I a Woman. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about, before you, I'm going to let you get your thoughts together, and I'm just going to defer to D for a second, real second, real quick here. So why was it important to you to end the film that way? Because I thought it was a brilliant ending to a very well-told story. Mm. To have all of those beautiful images of all of these women and all their glory and all their truth and whatever that came in and have this beautiful song that Miss Stacy wrote to, you know, tie it all together. You know, since the, the very beginning of doing Kokomo City, <clears throat> from literally the conception to the end was completely divine. Like, I really mean that. Like, some things just lined up till I was just in complete awe of how things worked out. Um, and and that song was no exception. Um, I showed Stacy a couple of images of, of Kokomo City when I first started, maybe filmed two of the girls, no one else, and put together a little small makeshift kind of like trailer to give her an idea of where I was going. She immediately... I, I think said a few curse words like what the fuck bitch quote was crazy <laughs> and also and also she sent like five songs like and and out of those songs like two of them really stuck out but ain't I woman was like top of the list and I already had this imagery I already had already filmed Dominique at the end and I was like how impactful and effective would it be for a woman um, to sing and serenade basically to trans women in this film in such a way, especially the image of Dominique just owning her complete transgenderism in such a profound way. It, it's it's just kind of like, it, it kind of like just marriage us as women, mm-hmm. you know, and it creates a new uh, trajectory and a new dialogue where as opposed to us being not liking each other, like I don't you know, um, but there were well, a lot of women like us and a lot of trans women like you. So that song was made not for Kokomo City. She had that song actually made for a film that Lena uh, Wait. Wait, no, that did no, well, her, no. her, her it was wife. Here, but it was for Harriet Tubman. Stop yeah, it! It's for the movie Harriet Tubman. Oh. And, and I guess Stacy was dragging her feet and it didn't make the damn No, because they so. was like... Oh. <laughs> She's like, don't throw me under the bus. <laughs> What happened was I did a song and it, you know the people that asked me to to submit it um, drug, drug, drug their feet, which which is great because it ended up here. Absolutely, mm-hmm. Absolutely. it wasn't supposed to be in here. And, and I didn't care what the lyrics said about slaves or nothing, honey. I didn't want to change anything because honestly, as a producer, some things you don't. It's not even worth trying to recreate. You know, it's just the beauty wherever she was in that moment when she created that song. It belonged in this mm-hmm. because it matched the vulnerability of Daniela, it matched the vulnerability of Coco and all the other girls and even Lo, right? So why change that and compromise what Stacy had already created? You got it, right? It still mm-hmm. feels like it was made for that scene. So that's that's pretty much how that happened. That song made me feel like a woman, Stacey. Me too. Mm-hmm. And my sister cried. Mm-hmm. My sister's a complete bitch. My <laughs> blood sister. <laughs> My blood sister. How many Virgos do we have in here? Oh, no! Oh, no! Why cute? No. My blood sister, she's she's very tough. She's it's hard. I've never in my entire life, ever, I'm the oldest, I've never seen her cry. She heard that song and saw the imagery for the first time and she cried. I'm laughing because it was unbelievable and I couldn't do anything to stop her from crying but hug her and I started crying. But that's how powerful that 
a pink song is. And my sister is also transgender. Oh, and wow. so that broke her down and it lifted her up. Mm. It, 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 it just took all of the fence that she had, all of the, it, it, it was, you're divine and it was made for us. That song was made for us. Yeah. It was, it's gonna touch so many people. So talk to the us about that song. The thing um, is that in your filmmaking, you made that song made sense. Even when you talk about like, you know, it's from slavery time and the things that we've been dealing with, we've been existing mm -hmm. and, and, and living in, mm -hmm. the song makes complete sense mm -hmm. with the movie you created. And the, and the even you, Daniela, when it was like, is it, um, you said something, it was a quotable, you said between the 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 house mm. or mm -hmm. the field yeah oh the part yeah. about the slaves yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. between you kept the, referring yeah. back to it so it's like it is one of those wow. moments wow i never even right <laughs> <knew> that. <laughs> that's crazy it is one of i guess you know i watched you edit this thing for years so I'm like, <laughs> I, I even need to sit in here and to tell you that like this is one of the most incredible moments in my career, just as a songwriter and a creative one, because I'm doing this with my friend. I've known her since 2004. She's the reason I got my publishing deal. Those those songs, um, and to be here now to even talk about it, like I just, I'm beyond grateful. Thank you. Snaps and claps. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me real quick about mm -hmm. where that wh where did that song come from within so you? The truth. Mm -hmm. um, she had a poem called Ain't I One of You. And I was, oh. yeah, so that's what, what it came from. Um, so Will Smith's camp was doing a, um, a documentary. It's called The Men. And that's how I initially even like got to the poem. So actually it was two, two, damn. It was two, <laughs> it was two things that was supposed to be in and it ended up here. Will Smith and Harriet. Oh. Harriet. He just wasn't there for him. He just wasn't, and that third time was wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and so that's how it got like, so they sent me the poem and I was like, damn, this would be a dope song. And then Coco Sarai, who um, helped me write the second verse, she was like, Guitar Center is about to close, y'all. Y'all need to go buy that guitar. <laughs> and literally, we went and bought the guitar and wrote that song in my house. And that's that. What, and she, when she saw me, when she showed me the clip, I was like, girl, I got a song. I, I, you might not be the have the whole song, maybe just the hook. And I won't because it didn't make sense, but it made sense. You know what I'm saying? I love that. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much for letting me drag you out of the audience <laughs> <laughs> and coming up here and telling us that story Thank because you. I thought it was important to be shared that you talk that. about that because it's the end of the film and it's toward the end of our discussion. And so I couldn't end the discussion without talking to you about that song because it's amazing. Thank it's you. amazing. Yes, ma'am. So I just want to thank everybody, Daniela, Harris, D, and Stick. <laughs> 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 Stacy, you are making my job difficult today. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you, and this thing had already left. No, I thought you were killing me. No, 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 no. But I want to thank you for letting me drag you up here, and I want to thank everyone on the panel for coming up and having this discussion about Kokomo City. It's an amazing film. Thank you. Tell all of your friends to go see it. It's really a very enlightening and heartfelt film. It's a little raw. It's a little raw. But that's okay because that world is a little raw. So yes. you, you deal, you're dealing with it from the gritty point of view and reality point of view that it is. And I appreciate you for that. You. I'm your moderator, Carla Renata. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. out. Absolutely.